Cassie watched sadly through the tiny window of the car carrying the prisoners. She had never in her life felt such horror and pain. Weak, gray-faced, with deep wrinkles, her thin, gray hair twisted into a ball at the top of her head. Metal shackles glistened in her weak hands. Cassie's age is no small thing, 75 years, which she has lived with dignity. All her life she worked as a paramedic in a rural hospital. For her work, she received nothing but gratitude. She never heard a bad word from either the hospital's head doctor or the villagers. The woman would never have dreamed that over the years she would be charged with a criminal offense. I won't be able to bear it. I won't be able to bear this shame. If my son Billy were alive, none of this would have happened, Cassie thought with horror. No sooner had she recovered from another nervous jolt, when the car suddenly stopped and a loud female voice said, One more outside. The elderly woman was brought among other inmates to the detention center Cassie had endured hours of medical examinations and humiliating searches, and now, under the watchful eye of her supervisor, she was led to a cell. The woman with a mattress and bedding on her back could barely move her legs. Eventually, the cell door at the front opened and closed behind Cassie with a loud bang. She looked inside the cell and staggered. For a moment she thought she was going to faint. A row of upper and lower bunks stretched out before her. A row that seemed to go on forever. Dozens of eyes were watching her. Some with a smile, some with curiosity, and some even with open hatred. The woman was trying hard not to lose her temper, though her intuition told her that something terrible was about to happen. She sat down automatically on the edge of a vacant bed, throwing her mattress and bedclothes there, look at her, she sat down, old woman. And where's the greeting? You didn't go into the cow shed. Who gave you permission to sit down? Get up now. An unpleasant female voice could be heard from the depths of the cell. Cassie's heart clenched at such a disgusting attitude. She couldn't even move. The woman had always treated people with kindness, and people repaid her with kindness. Such horror as here in the cell had never happened to her. The prisoner interpreted the woman's reaction to her order as disobedience. He immediately jumped off her bed and appeared like a devil before her. Tall, strong as a rock, she towered over Cassie like a kite over its prey, why didn't you get up? Have you completely lost your fear? I don't care that you're old. In prison and in the bathroom everyone's the same, and since you've come here, you must listen to me. She growled and, to intimidate her, put her hand on the woman's head. When he saw that Cassie was neither alive nor dead, he suddenly decided to play a joke on her and embarrass her. She laughed irritatingly and uttered words that made the poor woman's skin crawl. What, old man, you've been living a long time without a husband, haven't you? It's hard being single, isn't it? Want to have some fun? You'll remember your youth. There was a loud, heart-rending laugh in the cell. Another prisoner, who had become so naughty, shouted at the top of her voice, Lift up your skirt. Now we'll cheer you up. Come on, women. Cassie was speechless at the disgusting chaos around her. She opened her mouth like a fish to scream, but couldn't get a word out. This only provoked another round of wild laughter from the inmates. The next second, the old woman heard the loud trotting of several feet. With each passing moment, the trotting grew louder and louder, and it seemed as if it was about to engulf the poor woman. These people, as if they had been knocked out by something, lost their human appearance and crossed the boundary between good and evil. As soon as the madness swirled around Cassie, her eyes darkened. It was as if a hundred hands were pulling her straight to hell. After another jolt, the woman couldn't take it anymore, she fell down and fainted, hey, we don't have any business if anything. The old woman herself slipped and fell down, frightened out of her wits, hissed the prisoner, pretending to be a commander. At that moment the heavy cell door opened and the warden came in, what have you here? She cried. The old woman slipped and heard herself, answered the prisoner, as if nothing had happened. Didn't you help her, Clark? Me? What's the matter with you? I didn't even lay a finger on her. I don't really need her, she said nonchalantly. Cassie found herself in a room with white walls and a white door, and above her was the beautiful face of someone. It seemed to her that she was already in heaven, where she was well and there was no pain, and next to her was an angel. Suddenly, the woman felt someone holding her hand and called out, Come here, quick. She came to her senses. Cassie slowly opened her eyes and felt a middle-aged man watching her intently. His face and voice seemed familiar. The man spoke with empathy, Mrs. Cassie, you've finally woken up. That's very good. My name is Lucian Cooper. I work here as a prison doctor, 
after giving the woman a compassionate look, the doctor couldn't hold back a wave of emotion and exclaimed. My God, what have they done to you? What kind of beasts are they? Indeed, they belong in prison. Doctor, what happened to me? Cassie asked in an exhausted voice. The woman realized that, unfortunately, she was in a prison hospital, not in paradise. This means that the nightmare of the last few days is about to continue, soft tissue contusions, hematomas, fractures and head trauma, thank God you don't have any. You've been beaten. But for what? How could anyone raise a hand against you? There is nothing sacred in such people, continued the doctor. Suddenly Cassie remembered the events of yesterday. She shrank inwardly, and tears came to her eyes. The doctor got up and hurried to comfort the woman, Mrs. Cassie, please don't cry. I beg you. It's all over. Nothing bad will happen to you here again, I promise. And a second later, he asked shyly, don't you remember me? Cassie shook her head slightly. Lucian, you're my Billy's classmate. Then you served together in a hot spot. Good for you for graduating from medical school. Yes, I did, but I work as a doctor in prison. That's how it happened, Lucian said, slightly embarrassed. What's wrong with that? A prison needs a doctor too. So did my Billy want to take up medicine, if. The woman fell silent, swallowing the lump of tears that rose in her throat. If only he hadn't been killed in battle just days before he was due to return home, yes, the man said with a heavy sigh, I owe Billy my life. He pulled me and a few other boys out of the shelling then, so we survived and were not maimed. And he himself fought bravely in an unequal battle with the enemy. Your son is a hero, a real one. I don't forget him every day, so it's a matter of honor for me to help you. Thank you, Lucian. After my son's death, I was left alone. My husband, Peter, died of a heart attack a long time ago. But I'm still alive. Thanks to the memory of my son and my husband, I still walk the earth. I worked honestly, and the villagers respected me. And what happens now? So much shame and humiliation down the years. Cassie has turned pale. It was awful and painful for her to realize that she had now become a criminal. Lucian took the woman's hand and squeezed it firmly in his, as if to calm her and inspire confidence. Mrs. Cassie, how can you be considered a criminal, because you are a good-hearted person? I am sure that your presence here is a monstrous mistake and all the villagers think the same. Please tell me what happened to you. The woman believed in the sincerity of the doctor's words. She always treated people with kindness, and the desire to help, to support, to comfort was the strongest for her. Already retired, Cassie became a phytotherapist and spell healer. This is a hereditary tradition in their family. Cassie's grandmother was a renowned healer in their area, and even beyond. She healed people with herbs and other folk remedies. Many villagers appreciated Cassie's work. Her medicinal herbal infusions, herbal collections and decoctions worked wonders and got rid of illnesses. And all would have been well, if it hadn't been for an incident that landed her behind bars. The woman, barely holding back her tears, decided to tell Lucian all about it, last summer, it rained a lot. The grass grew like crazy. That Sunday morning, Cassie, armed with a hoe, went to the vegetable garden where the potatoes were growing to weed them for the third time in a season. Diligently, she pulled weeds and ragweed and suddenly heard someone at the edge of the garden moaning. He approached and, in surprise, dropped the tool from his hands. A young man was lying in the furrows. Completely beaten, with numerous bruises. What happened to you, my dear man? Cassie asked frightened. I'm not well, can't you see? The bandits attacked me on the road. They beat me up, took the last of my money. And this house was the smallest in the village, so I came here, the man groaned weakly. So you have to go to the hospital. I'll go to my neighbor's house and call an ambulance, Cassie fussed. Wait! The stranger shouted. There was no need for an ambulance. You'd better get me some water to drink. Cassie brought him some water and, as he drank, she noticed that the man looked like her late son. As time passed since her son's death, the pain in Cassie's heart did not subside. On the contrary, it became even more acute. Involuntarily, in each man's appearance, she looked for traits of her son. And in this stranger she found them, or perhaps she didn't find them, but only seemed to. What's your name? She asked, holding her breath. My name is Billy. At the mention of her son's name, Cassie's heart leapt and she finally empathized with the young man. He stubbornly refused to go to the hospital. Still he kept refusing, it's nothing. I'll lie down for a bit and then I'll go. 
Cassie couldn't help herself and, without realizing what was happening, proposed to him out of a pure maternal heart. But you're very weak. You know what, let's go back to my place. I'll make you some herbs, I'll treat your bruises with lotions. You'll feel better. Well, if you'll allow me, the man agreed and smiled languidly. In the house, Cassie treated Billy's scratches, prepared herbs, then fed the guest. He had recovered a little and began to look around. His attention was particularly drawn to the icons, of which there were many in the house, you must have bought them all in the shops, he smiled. No, what's the matter with you, Cassie replied, amazed to the core. These are very old, ancient icons, handed down from generation to generation. They are about 350 years old. And maybe even more. Wow, the man hissed. A few minutes later, Billy suddenly asked, Madam, I'll sleep at your place tonight, okay? I feel a little weak. It will be hard for me to walk. Okay, I'll prepare your bed in the room, Cassie agreed. She fell asleep quickly, just putting her head on the pillow. Did she have time to wonder how this happened? For years she had been tormented by insomnia and slept little and poorly. The night passed unnoticed. In the morning, Cassie woke up at dawn and started to prepare breakfast, but for some reason the cat scratched at her heart, as if something bad had happened. Her intuition wasn't wrong. She looked into the room where Billy was, opened the door and was stunned. The man was no longer there. The next moment, the woman screamed in horror. There wasn't even an icon on the wall. All the wealth, so carefully preserved by each generation of her family, had been shamelessly stolen. Cassie's eyes were throbbing and tears were streaming down her face, God, how naive I am, the poor woman wailed, I let the criminal in and didn't even ask his last name. My God, why did you punish me like that? Her heart ached in her chest and Cassie sat down on the bed, but a few minutes later she was startled by a deafening knock on the door. Opening the door, the woman froze. In the doorway stood three young policemen, had God heard my prayers, and yet sent these men to find the murderer? Cassie said, but one of the policemen interrupted her mercilessly, are you Cassie Allen? I have a warrant to search your house, check it, yes yes, of course. I was robbed last night, the woman fidgeted nervously. What are you doing? Cassie wondered, seeing the policeman searching her potion jars and herb bags one by one. No one bothered to answer her. I found it, suddenly shouted one of the policemen, holding a small bag with a white substance in his hand towards his superior. I've never had anything like this before, Cassie thought, where did you get it? Asked the policeman, shaking the bag in front of her nose. I don't know, Cassie looked at the contents of the bag in astonishment. I see, I thought so, the policeman replied in an indifferent voice. And what is this, I hope you recognize. In his hands he held one of the woman's jars containing a thick potion, yes, that's my jar, said the unsuspecting woman. At the same second, the policeman grabbed a spoon and took the contents of the jar, what do you say now? Cassie shuddered as she realized what was happening. Her face immediately turned deathly pale. She whispered with white lips, the potion is mine, but the white crumbs in it are not. The policeman grinned and, leaning towards the woman's face, said, do you believe what you say? You are suspected of possessing banned substances and using them to perform illegal healing rituals. You are poisoning people, do you understand? I am not poisoning anyone. This is not my dust, I was framed, shouted Cassie, unable to contain her emotions. Everything inside her was trembling from such a terrible injustice, it's not mine, I was framed. Do you know how many suspects say the same thing when they're arrested? The policeman asked with a grin. Every one of them. And after a few seconds, he added, you are under arrest on suspicion of committing a serious crime. I'll give you fifteen minutes to pack your things. Cassie stood there, unable to move. It seemed to her that in a moment she would drop dead. What, I'm going to jail? Yes, and for a long time, the policeman replied with a frightening calm. The old woman's heart clenched with fear and helplessness. Gathering up the rest of her strength, she pleaded, I am guilty of nothing. I have done nothing. I was robbed this evening and these substances were probably planted on me. Find the perpetrators, please. We'll take care of it said one of the policemen. In the meantime, what's done is done. Do you have any illegal substances? Yes, and it's in your house. Get your things ready immediately and don't burden us with unnecessary speculation. Cassie was in tears as she finished her story about the tragedy that had happened in her life. Lucian listened attentively and even winced from time to time, 
nervously raising an eyebrow at the terrible injustice that had been done to the poor woman by the lawman. Twice he ran for painkilling drops when he realized Cassie was on the verge of a heart attack. A lawsuit is next. The prosecutor is threatening to give me at least six years. God, for what? And the criminal who robbed me has not been found, said the woman desperately. Mrs. Cassie, it shouldn't be like this. You are only guilty because, out of the goodness of your heart, you let a man into your house who turned out to be a criminal. I promise I will do everything in my power to help you. I will spare no money and hire an expensive lawyer. If you don't win immediately in court, we will appeal the verdict in higher courts and seek evidence of your innocence, Lucian promised, enthusiastically. But that's easy to say, but very hard to do. Lucian kept his word and hired one of his best lawyers. He did his best to prove Cassie's innocence, but to no avail. The prosecutor stuck to his guns and won the case. Six long years, that's the sentence, we'll appeal the verdict, we really will, shouted the angry lawyer. Meanwhile, Cassie had to face a harsh reality. In a terrible moral state and with a broken soul, she was sent to prison. It became clear to her that if the other inmates greeted her the same way as her cellmates in the detention center, it was absolutely certain that there would be nothing left of her in this world. She already knew she could no longer endure the excruciating abuse and shame. But at least in this respect Cassie was lucky. There were many cellmates, thirty of them, but they didn't mock the old woman, on the contrary, they respected her and genuinely empathized with her. Cassie, along with other inmates, lived a miserable existence in prison. During the day, she worked tirelessly in the prison sewing room, choked on disgusting canteen food, spent half-sleepless nights on an uncomfortable bed in her cell and listened tirelessly to other inmates' stories of broken human destinies. One moment was the favorite of all prisoners, walks in the prison yard. They weren't long, fifteen to twenty minutes. And if they were lucky, even half an hour. The women greedily inhaled the air and couldn't get enough of it. For them it was not just air, but a sweet gulp of freedom, which they could enjoy very soon. And, of course, Cassie's soul was warmed by letters from her son's colleague Lucian and her beloved villagers. And so two years passed. Two whole years. Cassie's health, given her advanced age, deteriorated suddenly. She realized she couldn't last another four years in prison. The woman cried herself to sleep at night, realizing that she would never see her native village, her beloved villagers, her home. And, most importantly, she would never visit her son's grave. Cassie knew clearly that salvation lay in God. She sincerely believed in Christ and that he would help her. She prayed fervently to the Almighty every day and kissed the icon with the image of Christ. And one day, when it was bitterly cold outside, salvation came to her, unexpectedly and amazingly. In the morning, she was awakened by a deafening knock on her cell door. Prisoner Allen, out, the guard's voice called. It turned out that she had been summoned by the head of the prison, Mr. Perkins Gary. He greeted her respectfully and offered her a seat, Mrs. Cassie, I must tell you that new circumstances have opened up in your case. At an international auction, old icons stolen from you were found. Miraculously, the perpetrators have been caught and are testifying. There's a good chance you're not guilty. If it can be proved that the banned substances were infiltrated into your home, the case will be re-examined. Hearing these words, Cassie cried bitterly. There was nothing the prison governor could do about it so she went to her cell in tears. A month later, the old woman's eyes were once again filled with tears. Only they were already tears of joy. Cassie had finally been exonerated. Three days later, the massive prison gates closed behind her. Lucian Cooper greeted her. Like a son, he embraced the old woman and kissed her wrinkled hands. I promise to visit you very often, Mrs. Cassie. You won't have time to miss me, said the man sincerely. Good, Lucian. The way home was short and full of happiness. And the way to the cemetery seemed even shorter to the woman. She almost ran towards her son. Hello, Billy. Here I am, here I am with you, Cassie said, kissing the photo on the monument. I'm sorry I haven't come for a long time. How are you here without me? I've been sick without you. And now I'm happy that we're together again. And soon we'll be even closer. Well, you know what I mean. The snow, with white fluffy flakes fell on the grave and on the woman's clothes, on her face and on her red gloveless hands. And for a long time she didn't want to leave. She couldn't leave. Suddenly, for a moment, it seemed to her that the wind was rustling in her ears. I'm fine, mother. We'll live. We'll live, 
Cassie repeated, raised her head and smiled at the sky. Dear all, thank you very much for listening, and if you enjoyed the story, then please feel free to support me with a like and post your thoughts in the comments. I wish you all a wonderful evening and a peaceful night. See you soon. Bye.